Ben Marlin. I'm a faculty member at the College of Information and Computer Sciences at uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, my research area is machine learning. I've been working in machine learning for mobile health uh, for almost 10 years now. Um, so the, the talk this morning is going to focus on machine learning approaches in mHealth. Um, I'm going to start um, with uh, some um, information about sort of mobile health, just background to sort of set some context. We'll build up a little bit of a conceptual model of what the domain looks like um, with the primary goal of trying to understand sort of how machine learning fits into mobile health. So what are the use cases and where is it useful um, to think about machine learning approaches um, within the sort of mobile health context? Um, so we'll, we'll start there. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about sort of the machine learning um, toolkit or machine learning approaches um, and what their sort of fundamental properties look like, um, different categories of machine learning problems, um, and where, um, again, they might specifically be useful uh, in an mHealth context. Um, we'll go through a fairly detailed example um, of the application of machine learning methods for um, state inference, particularly um, in the case of smoke and puff detection. So we'll sort of use that as a walkthrough. I don't quite want to say a, a use case um, or a case study because we're going to do it at a bit of a high level, just looking at sort of what are the fundamental principles and what are the fundamental ingredients that are required to apply ML methods um, to a particular problem. Um, in the second half of the lectures this morning, um, Santosh Kumar is going to go over actual use cases, uh, more fleshed out. Uh, a sort of variety of different examples, including building on the one that I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, and then we'll wrap up with um, some um, sort of flow in the other direction from mHealth into machine learning. So what are the challenges that the mHealth domain really poses for machine learning? What are the sort of use-inspired research uh, questions that arise in machine learning coming out of mobile health? And there are a number of them um, that are quite interesting and fundamental um, that folks in the machine learning side um, are working on actively to support work that's going on in mHealth. So that's our broad outline. Uh, for um, the first piece, and again, it will tie directly into the second lecture um, that will follow up uh, immediately afterwards. So to get started, uh, again, I want to sort of build out a little bit of a conceptual model um, around mHealth, just so that we have a little bit of a common foundation to start talking about where machine learning fits in, which is our first uh, task for this morning. Um, so we'll start with a really basic model, thinking about an observational study design. Um, so um, in, a, in a study design um, of this type, um, we'll start, say, uh, with a researcher who has a particular problem that they're interested in. There's some facet um, of, of um, health or behavior that they're interested uh, in studying. Um, so they'll define a uh, sort of participant population, a cohort. Um, those uh, participants obviously exist in some in broader context. Um, we'll think of that context as sort of uh, constituting that patient's or that participant's environment. So everything that's external to the participant, um, other than the researcher, we'll say uh, is part of the environment. So that might constitute um, uh, sort of family context, um, where you know where the person lives what their neighborhood looks like, um, what their broader maybe healthcare um, situation looks like. So anything external to the patient and to the researcher will say is part of the environment um, in this conceptual model, right? Um, and so the idea here is that the researcher is interested in studying some particular um, facet of this sort of system comprising the patient and the environment. Um, and so we'll say um, those aspects um, are the state that the researcher is interested in. And we say state here because we're interested specifically in dynamical systems or collecting longitudinal data. So we're interested in sort of what's happening over time um, with our um, participant population, right? So at every time T, um, we have some collection of aspects of the participant in the environment that we're maybe interested in collecting. Um, and we'll refer to those as the, um, as the state. Um, there may be some distinguished aspects of the state um, that we're interested in um, that are more at the level of sort of health outcomes and other context information. And so we'll think about sort of a parallel pathway um, whereby we're observing uh, outcomes specifically um, derived from the patient or from the participant. So in our observational study, we're not treating, we're not intervening, we're just observing, we're collecting data, and we're maybe uh, interested in understanding relationships between particular aspects of state and particular outcomes that we're interested in, right? So this broadly defines sort of what, what uh, observational studies look like in any domain. Um, in mHealth specifically, um, the interesting aspects have to do with the use of particular forms of technology to actually mediate the data collection or the collection of the state information. So sitting out front here, um, we may have some collection involving um, traditional tools like self-report or ecological momentary assessment. Um, some of that self-report may be technology mediated. It may be coming in through smartphones or web interfaces or various kinds of platforms. Um, in mHealth, um, a particular interest is the use of passing sensing, passive sensing modalities. So we may have smartwatches. Um, we may have various kinds of fitness bands, we may have other kinds of wearable um, and ambient physiological sensors um, through which we're collecting uh, data about the participant or uh, about the environment. 
Um, so in this basic sort of conceptual model, um, the first place where machine learning comes in um, is actually mediating between the state and outcome information that we would like to uh, infer about the participant or the environment and the data that we're actually collecting via these modalities. Um, so with lots of um, sort of computational biomarkers that we might like to get at or inferences about activities, um, we can collect various forms of raw data um, through these passive sensing modalities, um, but that raw data isn't directly giving us the information that we want. It's providing data, but it's not providing direct information about the states or about the outcomes. Um, and so a lot of instances, what we need to do is take that raw data and process it in some way um, and machine learning is one of the fundamental tools that you can use to do this form of data-driven analysis where we want to map our raw underlying, um, let's say, sensor data um, into the states and outcomes, semantic states and outcomes that we're actually interested in. And so we'll look at some concrete examples of what those um, sort of uh, kinds of data look like um, and kinds of mappings look like as we go along. Um, to flesh out the conceptual model uh, a little bit more, um, we can think beyond just observational studies where we're just observing. Right. Um, so the next thing that we can think about is an interventional study where we, there's actually some intervention that's happening, right? And so ML sort of comprises both of these aspects. There are both observational studies and, and interventional studies. In an, in an interventional study, um, there's going to be some sort of intervention um, that is uh, provided to the participant. Um, that intervention could be sort of like a standard um, classical RCT where people are randomized into an intervention or a control arm one time and that's it. Um, or you can have something that's more sequential um, and potentially sequential and adaptive um, where the intervention components that are being um, provided to the participant are not static. They're actually varying over time. They might be varying randomly. Um, that's a design called the micro-randomized trial. Um, if you do it sort of intensively through time. Um, and uh, they could also be optimized. So you have something like a just-in-time adaptive intervention where you're actually optimizing the selection of intervention components through time. So if you think about where sort of technology pieces fit in over here, um, if we're doing something just in time and adaptive, providing messaging or nudging or various other forms of um, intervention components um, through mobile devices, um, that's sort of one form uh, where, where technology comes into play again through the actual delivery of intervention content um, in a, a just in time or adaptive fashion. Um, and then the corresponding machine learning piece that's over here, um, where if we're talking about um, what intervention component to provide to which participants at which time, um, that's an optimization process where, again, machine learning methods are highly relevant. Um, so we'll talk about sort of which forms of machine learning problems correspond to these different use cases uh, across this sort of uh, conceptual model. But there are these two sort of separate um, use cases that are quite fundamental around translating raw data into um, actual uh, information that we're interested in. Um, and then, again, taking that information that comes in um, and combining it with self-report and trying to drive a, pro a process of adaptive uh, intervention selection. Um, and so this is sort of what the interventional side uh, looks like. If we think about a care scenario where we're actually going to take maybe an intervention package of some kind and deploy it uh, for care, for treatment, um, the picture looks basically the same. Right. So the labels change a little bit. Maybe instead of the process being driven by a researcher, it's being driven by a clinician. We don't have participants. We have patients. Um, our interventions that we're studying become treatments. <clears throat> but the rest of the picture sort of looks the same. So when you pick up mHealth technologies that have been developed and that have been tested, and you're looking at actually deploying them in a care scenario, um, there really isn't a difference between what this picture looks like and what this one looks like from the perspective of um, the sort of technology and um, machine learning components that might be deployed. Okay. So that's our sort of big picture that we'll, we'll build off of in terms of contextualizing the use of machine learning. Um, to summarize, um, it's these sort of three um, archetypal problems. Um, the first one we'll call state inference. So this is inferring aspects of the state of the patient and or the patient's environment uh, from passively sensed or other data. Um, and this is also known as context inference specifically in the case of just-in-time adaptive interventions. Um, the complementary problem on the outcome side looks pretty similar. So when you get down to sort of what do the details look like, um, if we're talking about outcomes, um, again, one person's sort of state variables might be another person's outcome variables and vice versa, depending on exactly what you're, you're studying or intervening on. Um, but for outcomes here, there's some notion of maybe um, proximal or distal outcomes we're interested in um, that we're attempting to assess based on passively sensed and other data. So here, even simple, outcomes, um, something basic for physical activity like steps, right? So you might have a, you might sort of provide a Fitbit device to your participants or to your patients to collect information about step count. 
But it's important to recognize that even basic um, outcomes of that type are themselves inferences, right? So the Fitbit has an accelerometer on it. It has uh, uh, you know, a couple of sensors and it's using that sense information to infer step counts at the wrist, which is actually a non-trivial task, right? Um, so lots of um, outcome measures that you might think about are not directly observed unless you bring people back in you know, to the lab or to the clinic um, and you're doing some direct measurement or direct observation. Um, if there's some sensing modality involved um, to produce outcomes or produce outputs, then likely that's mediated by some underlying algorithm or algorithmic component that may be derived from a sort of machine learning pipeline. Right? Um, the last piece in here is the treatment or intervention selection. Um, here, like I said, this is really a problem of optimizing the selection of treatment and intervention components um, based on measured or inferred aspects of patient state and outcomes. So when you drive these adaptive intervention loops based on passive sensing, um, you end up with a dual sort of use of machine learning uh, components where you're both sort of translating raw data into states and uh, outcomes and then looking at the states and outcomes via algorithms to try to drive the problem of uh, optimizing therapeutic efficacy by the choice of intervention components that are selected. So both, you can sort of operate just-in-time adaptive interventions in this closed loop kind of way, um, where ML is interpreting your data and it's also sort of uh, assisting with selecting the intervention components that are actually being delivered uh, to patients. So uh, the first two problems here are quite similar to each other, as I mentioned. The last one's very different. And so um, as you run through some of the lectures um, in this early part of the Institute, you'll hear more about um, adaptive treatment design and different types of um, observational and interventional studies um, that will relate to this uh, particular use case of uh, optimizing uh, the selection of intervention or treatment components. For today, uh, we're gonna focus up here at the top of the stack around state inference, and we'll look specifically um, at some problems around uh, inferring particular aspects of state, as I mentioned, and in, in the second part of the uh, talks this morning, you'll see some more examples. Okay, so before we get into examples, I wanna run through some machine learning um, foundations. So again, our assumption here is that this is a very interdisciplinary group. Um, some people may have extensive background in machine learning, um, other people may have uh, none. So this is meant to be a leveler um, of sorts to sort of describe some of the different kinds of machine learning problems. Uh, that exist. I'll show you some prototypical examples of their use cases, not necessarily in the health domain, and then we'll come back to this problem of state inference once we have a little bit of foundation under our feet uh, for thinking about what machine learning is and sort of what it, what it can do for us. <clears throat> so uh, I think we'll start with the idea that uh, machine, machine learning sort of really provides a toolkit. Um, specifically, it's providing a toolkit of data analytic methods that are designed to solve various categories of inference, prediction, data representation, and decision-making problems. Um, so there are sort of archetypal problems in machine learning defined by their required inputs and outputs. Um, different archetypal problems have different input and output requirements. Um, when you're looking at applied use of machine learning, the first question is sort of which of these archetypal problems does my specific um, application fall into? Um, once you can sort of work out which machine learning problem is the closest fit, let's say, to what you're trying to do, um, you can gain access to a broad class of specific methods, maybe with different properties from a computational uh, perspective. Maybe some are, uh, you know, have slower runtimes, some are faster, some are more flexible, some are less flexible. Um, some maybe allow you to incorporate more domain knowledge or less domain knowledge, um, and so on. So this is the basic setup, though. The things to keep in mind is machine learning is not a sort of homogeneous construct. There's lots of different specific archetypal problems. Um, I'm going to take you through sort of five categories of problems. Those categories have their own specialized subcategories, and there's other categories that we're not going to touch on. Uh, machine learning is quite a, quite a broad field. Um, this will just serve as sort of a reasonable overview at a level that will allow us to sort of orient for what is um, useful at a high level uh, for M health specifically. So um, the first four categories of problems that we're going to talk about, um, again, fall into sort of two even higher level groups. Um, the first two are uh, problems in learning to detect and predict. Um, and there are two underlying flavors for learning to detect and predict. Um, the first flavor um, we'll call classification. And the second we'll call regression. So for folks who have a background in statistics, um, you're probably very familiar with regression methods via regression analysis. Um, regression models, are, in fact, many of these models can be used in different ways. Um, there are some differences between how models are often used in statistics and how they're used in machine learning, even if they have sort of similar or the same uh, names. So you might be familiar with regression analysis from the perspective of applying models to understand relationships between covariates and outcomes. 
um, looking at p-values of coefficients and linear models and things like that. Um, in machine learning, the, the sort of same model structures uh, are often used, but they're used in a different way, which is actually to issue predictions. Um, and so we'll talk about what that sort of predictive uh, flavor of modeling uh, looks like as we go uh, as we go forward. The difference between classification and regression just has to do with what are the outputs of these predictive models. So in a regression context, we're thinking about outputs that are um, numerical, continuous, sort of real valued uh, outputs. And in classification, what we're trying to do is sort of predict categories um, for objects, and those categories are discrete. So the difference between classification and regression really comes down to, are we trying to predict some quantity that is numerical, continuous, uh, or is it categorical and discrete? And so there are different classes of models for those two particular problems. They have a very similar input-output structure. It's just a question of sort of what kind of space does the output live in? Is it in a numerical space or is it in a space of categories? Um, the second group of problems are really about learning to organize and represent data that we have. So um, the first grouping um, is what is often referred to as supervised learning, where we assume that we have both sort of objects or representations of objects, and we have some kind of an output, whether it's a class label or it's a regression target. Um, the data fundamentally come in these pairs of inputs and outputs, or inputs and class labels, inputs and regression targets. In the second category, this unsupervised category, um, we just have data. There are no sort of distinguished elements in the data that are desired labels or outputs. Um, and our goal is just to try to think about how to um, organize the data that we have. And the two archetypal problems there are clustering and dimensionality reduction. Um, clustering is the problem of attempting to group data um, into, um, into uh, groups or subgroups. Um, that have similar attributes. The problem of dimension, dimensionality reduction is really about taking high dimensional data and attempting to um, reduce its dimension embedded in lower dimensional spaces that are maybe more amenable for various forms of analysis. Um, and that might include um, analyses like visualization. So if we have very high dimensional um, data coming off of a sensor system, we might be interested in embedding it into even a two dimensional space so that we can visualize and sort of see what it's doing. Um, there are other uses uh, we'll talk about um, in a bit. So these are sort of the four sort of four main categories of machine learning problems that people um, often study. And again, um, you know, they, they group into these supergroups of supervised and unsupervised. Um, and there are various um, additional um, sort of um, specializations and adjacent formulations. But for now, this will be sufficient for us. There's one more category that we'll come back to around decision making. But I'll give you some examples of what these four problems look like just to make them a little bit more uh, concrete. So classification, as I said, is this problem of learning to detect or recognize or predict a class or category um, associated with objects. And one of the classical um, applications of classification um, is the problem of image recognition or image classification. And so here the idea is that we're going to give a picture as input to a machine learning algorithm. And the algorithm has to give back to us the class of the um, sort of foreground object in that image. Um, so data sets of this type consist of pairs where you have images of different objects and you have the labels. So the top row here are all airplanes and we have automobiles and birds and so on. So there are versions of this so, sort of problem where people are interested in thousands or tens of thousands of different um, object types, basically corresponding to like all possible nouns that, that you could think of um, down to a particular semantic level. Um, and so the airplane, automobile, bird, these are the class labels for the objects, the objects themselves or the inputs are the images. So the fundamental ingredients for a classification problem like this are you need the inputs, whatever your description is of your uh, input object, and you need your corresponding class labels in order to formulate a problem as a classification problem. If you have data consisting of the inputs and the class labels, you can learn what is called a classifier that actually performs the predictive task um, of predicting the class label from the input. Um, regression, like I mentioned, is sort of the analogous problem, but what we're trying to predict is a numerical or continuous output. Um, the outcomes or outputs um, we'll refer to as targets for regression. Um, the inputs, um, again, have various names depending on what modeling tradition you're coming from. In statistics, you would call these the covariates. In machine learning, again, we would just call these the inputs. Um, the, the problem we're looking at here is a forecasting problem. This is recent CDC data for COVID hospitalizations. Um, forecasting is one particular application of regression. Um, our inputs are whatever data we can collect up to the time we need to issue the forecast. Um, and our target we're trying to predict is what's going to happen next for whatever this underlying process is. So again, uh, here we're looking at hospital admissions for COVID. And so there are lots and lots of examples of use cases of regression. This is probably a, the most familiar problem to people, I guess probably the most familiar problem to the most people um, in this particular group. So there's lots and lots of use cases for, um, for regression, regression models. <clears throat> 
Um, clustering, like I mentioned, is this problem where we're, we're interested in grouping objects um, according to their underlying attributes. Um, what we're looking at here is a, again, sort of now classical example of clustering applied to gene microarray expression data. Um, so the, the way this works, um, you would perform an assay by looking at um, assessing the gene expression levels for a collection of genes with respect to um, typically something like a collection of different um, tissues or um, whatever um, sort of additional structure you want to uh, include. Um, so every gene ends up having an expression profile um, over um, wherever that expression um, was assessed. Um, we might start off with a process where we, we have a collection of genes that are sort of, um, you know, they're well-defined, we can probe them, but we might not know what they do or how they relate to other genes. And so this is really an exploratory sort of data analysis technique, um, sort of shotgun approach where we just perform maybe a large-scale assay. Um, and then we get all this data back. It's totally unstructured. There's no labels. We know the gene names, but we might not know anything about their function or what's related to what. Um, and so here, cluster analysis has been used a fair bit to just try to take genes and group them out by expression profiles. And so that's what we're looking at here. Um, the method on the left-hand side is a form of hierarchical clustering that tries to first find um, small groups that groups pairs of genes together. And then it takes those pairs and tries to group them against uh, other individual genes or other uh, clusters that have been extracted so far. So you can see on the left-hand side here, this structure is called a dendrogram. It shows what's been merged together to form clusters. Um, once you extract this cluster structure, you can then reorder the data to visualize it or otherwise um, analyze it. And so that's what we're seeing here. You can see the sort of banded structure. Um, every row in this matrix is a different gene. The banded structure is showing, the sort of banded column structure is showing that the, this first block of genes all has similar uh, expression profiles. And we can see there's a couple of big blocks, maybe this top block, the middle block, and the third block here. Um, the approach on the right-hand side is another flat clustering approach. You tell it how many clusters you want, and it will try to find that number of clusters in the data for you. Um, and so we see this approach has sort of also identified sort of the same three broad clusters that we can see uh, on the left. Right. <clears throat> okay, so again, that's just about sort of trying to um, re-represent the data that we have. We have these individual expression profiles. If we can sort of collapse things into clusters, we have fewer entities that we can think about. Um, we can try to understand maybe what are these genes doing and why are they similar. Um, the same thing would be true of a general cluster analysis. The purpose is to group the data together so we can perform uh, additional analysis. Um, dimensional, dimensionality reduction, as I mentioned, um, is a problem of learning to represent um, high dimensional data in lower dimensional spaces. Um, there are lots of applications for these kinds of techniques when you're collecting high dimensional sensor data or other high dimensional signals. Um, often if we try to analyze those data directly, um, that can be cumbersome computationally and for other reasons. Um, and so we might try to take the data, um, retain its information with respect to whatever processes we're interested in, but sort of squeeze it down, compress it down uh, into lower dimensional structures, all the way down to something like, as I mentioned, where we might want to produce a two-dimensional map of our data, let's say, um, via um, a, a technique like this. Um, a lot of the classical methods in this space go back to sort of classical factor analysis, which is also probably a model that people are familiar with on the behavioral science side. Um, this uh, you know, methods and factor analysis, particularly exploratory factor analysis, came out of the analysis of survey data. So we're looking at a survey here that is actually items for um, the big five uh, personality constructs. Um, and so this, is, this particular battery has like hundreds of questions. Um, and when we're looking at analyzing individuals, we're not actually interested in their individual answers to all of these questions. Um, what we'd like to understand is are there underlying um, sort of a small number of underlying factors that maybe explain the responses to all of these hundreds of questions um, in the battery. Um, and so the sort of dimensionality reduction approach of factor analysis is designed to try to pull out um, some lower dimensional continuous space that explains the responses. And then you can analyze that space. So for people who know the big five, um, the, the sort of five uh, factors that get pulled out of uh, factor analysis of this kind of data um, are often referred to as openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. Um, and the idea is that any individual person can take a test of the form shown on the left and you can score it um, and produce the factors shown on the right. So you'll have a level of openness and a level of conscientiousness and so on across the big five factors. And the idea is that those five factors are supposed to explain uh, a large amount of the variation um, in the individual uh, responses on the left-hand side. So here we're maybe reducing dimensionality from hundreds of individual questions, or you know, something on the order of 100 um, responses down to something where we only have a five-dimensional representation. We can try to think about how people are similar or different um, in that much lower dimensional space. Um, if we're building, again, machine learning models, we might want to take these five 
factors as our inputs um, for looking at doing something with, with baseline personality data instead of the, the individual answers to the questions shown on the left. Okay. Um, and again, in ML factor, so factor analysis is a classical model. There are tons and tons of different models in machine learning that build on factor analysis. It's sort of a, it's a core modeling methodology and it has many different extensions um, for modeling nonlinear re relationships and modeling different kinds of data, uh, not necessarily producing continuous factors, but other kinds of factors as well. So it's an interesting space um, of approaches when you're in this regime of having generated very large scale data and now you wanna squeeze it down to analyze it more efficiently. Um, the last category um, that I'll mention here um, is a category called reinforcement learning. So this is um, in relation to supervised and unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning is a third high level category. Um, it's quite different than the others um, in that it's really about learning to act optimally in the world or in some environment based on experience. Um, and if you look at this diagram, this diagram is very similar to the one that we started off with around the sort of mHealth intervention loop. Um, so a, a just-in-time adaptive intervention in particular can be understood in a reinforcement learning context. Um, and that's exactly what people are doing in that space to sort of build machine learning methods for treatment selection. So the idea is that you have, again, you have some environment, um, you're acting in that environment by taking particular actions, AT, through time, so it's a sequential framework. Um, you get to observe states uh, of the environment, and there's also some reward function that tells you how good your actions are in the short term. So this maps into sort of the mHealth domain in a very immediate way. The agent is maybe a software component or a clinician um, who's taking actions to improve the state of the patient. Um, those actions are treatment or intervention selections. Um, the patient or the participant, um, this sort of constitutes the environment. Um, and the reward signal would be some form of like proximal outcome. So in a physical activity intervention, if you're trying to increase step count, let's say 30 minutes following some sort of intervention component delivery, then your proximal outcome would be what that step count looks like over the 30 minute interval. Um, and the state could be the rest, you know, the broader context that you're able to sense or otherwise infer. Right? So um, there's a very immediate mapping between RL um, and the intervention um, and treatment selection, sort of optimal intervention and treatment selection problem. So there's lots of interesting work in this area. Um, uh, Susan Murphy at Harvard and, and others um, are working specifically on the development of RL methods for the, for the mHealth domain, um, looking at the sort of um, specific properties of um, RL in um, that domain, given that we can't do things like directly observe exact states. So everything is sort of mediated by some form of uh, data generating process where maybe we're using machine learning to, um, to process raw data and produce inferences. Um, that the uh, actual decisions are based on. So that, that gives a flavor to these RL problems. It's a little bit more complex than some of the classical regimes. Um, but RL also has lots of different applications. Um, one that people might've heard about recently in the last couple of years is the application of RL to game playing. So RL has been applied to lots of different games, um, including um, games like chess and Go. So this is Google's DeepMind uh, AlphaGo uh, agent that is arguably I guess maybe not even arguably, maybe definitively um, the strongest player of this game of Go um, in the world currently. Um, there are very strong um, AI agents based on reinforcement learning um, that are able to play various video games and other kinds of uh, sort of interactive sequential uh, processes. So I think there's very specific use cases for RL technology inside um, mHealth, um, but then there are lots and lots of applications of it outside to robotics and self-driving vehicles and all kinds of other uh, contexts as well. Okay, so that um, sort of wraps the um, overview of the uh, foundations. Um, in the time that we've got left, we're gonna go over a specific um, application sort of use case or walkthrough um, for state inference specifically. Um, so I, I think it's probably apparent based on what we just described that um, the state inference problem and the outcome inference problem, they're both similar to each other. They're both sort of classification or regression problems. So here we've maybe got sensor data coming in on one side and we're trying to produce some output on the other side. Um, there are lots of different um, aspects of state that you might want to assess passively from sensor data. And so there are lots of different specific instances of the state inference problem. Some are classification, some are regression. It depends on what the output is. And I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, and then for treatment or intervention selection, this is RL um, as we described. Okay, so we're gonna focus here um, on the state inference problem domain. Um, the input side, again, for classification and regression, the, the fundamental thing is we need inputs and we need uh, our labels or regression targets to formulate the problem. Um, so on the input side, um, there's lots of different data that we could use for inputs. Um, there's lab data, there's self-report, and then there's sensor data as I was describing. So you can use sort of any combination of these data modalities 
um, as inputs to a problem of this type. Um, on the output side, that's going to depend on what the aspect of state is that we're interested in. So we might be interested in doing things like activity detection, event detection. We might be interested in inferring psychological, affective, cognitive states. Um, so things like detecting physical activity, detecting uh, smoking, detecting mood, um, detecting stress, um, and so on, right? So depending on um, what we're interested in exactly, what we'll need are corresponding labels. So for physical activity, um, again, uh, we might need, uh, you know, we might look at self-reported activity logs. We might bring people into a lab where we can directly observe them. Similarly for smoking, you might have people self-report smoking as a label. Um, that would be kind of noisy. You might, people, you might bring people into a lab setting where you can directly observe them. You might use uh, you know, device that people smoke through that records when smoking uh, is exactly happening uh, and so on. Right? So the fundamental ingredients here are we need the data we're going to use as inputs. We need um, some way to get at ground truth or near ground truth for class labels or regression targets. And then depending on what the process is, what aspect of state we're interested in, again, we, we need the labels for that particular uh, aspect to build out a model that will actually perform the predictions for us. So based on the inputs, produce the corresponding uh, outputs. Okay, so in the um, sort of walkthrough that we're going to run, uh, well, walkthrough that we'll run through, I guess, uh, we'll look at cigarette smoking um, and cigarette puff detection um, as a specific example and look at the sensor data, look at how to actually build uh, a detector for that particular process. Okay, so here's our, um, here's our walkthrough. So the way we'll define this problem, um, we're going to assume we have data from a respiration chest band sensor, that'll be our input. Um, and then based on the waveform for a given respiration cycle, we're going to need to decide whether each respiration cycle corresponds to a smoking puff or a regular uh, non-puff respiration cycle, right? <clears throat> so this is a classification problem. We're producing a discrete output. So the output's either puff or non-puff um, on a cycle by cycle basis. Okay, so we might have a chest band sensor that looks like this. So it's a device you'd have to wear around your chest. Um, this particular category of device is called the respiration inductance plasmograph. Um, it produces waveform data of the expansion and contraction of the chest as you breathe. Um, and then the class labels that we would need uh, to build a model of this type are the puff labels. So respiration cycle by respiration cycle, we're going to need to know whether uh, you, you were uh, smoking or not, right? So again, there are various ways to get at this, uh, get, to get at these labels. Um, a lot of the early work in this space was just done in the lab, having people come in, they were smoking cigarettes. Someone's either directly observing and like clicking a button every time the person takes a puff on the cigarette or um, recording video and then going and aligning the sensor data against the video um, to get at the labels, right? Okay, so if we look at the input data, the sensor data, um, this is what the respiration inductance plasmography data look like. Um, the uh, x-axis here is time in seconds. Um, we can't really see much of what's going on. We're looking at sort of 900 seconds of data. Um, we can see that there are amplitude variations and there are frequency variations happening, but it's pretty hard to see where you know, smoking specifically might be happening here. Um, if we zoom in a little bit closer um, and have a look at a zoomed in version of the data, again, the uh, x-axis is still in seconds, um, we can see some more structure. Um, so if you think about what smoking looks like and what how smoking behavior maybe affects respiration when you're smoking a cigarette, um, you can maybe pick out where the smoking respiration cycles are occurring here um, through the you know through time. So here's one, um, and then here's a bunch more um, inside this window, right? And so one of the one of the main effects when someone is smoking is that they're more deeply inhaling and exhaling, and as a result, um, there's an increase in the amplitude um, variation uh, for that cycle. So uh, we would call this feature maybe the um, stretch. Um, in the amplitude from the peak to um, the trough here. So this is peak, uh, this peak uh, exhalation, or it's peak inhalation and then exhalation, um, the way these data are set up. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing that you can see is because people are inhaling more deeply and they're exhaling more deeply, the duration of the respiration cycle, the length of it is also often longer. So when we're looking at taking the raw data um, and then building a machine learning on, on, uh, model on top of it, this process that we're performing is um, when we look at sort of features of the data is often referred to as featureization, right? So we're trying to take whatever data we have, it's already numerical, um, but if it's, you know, if we have different length samples, let's say for different respiration cycles, many machine learning methods just can't deal with that. They're gonna want a fixed dimensional representation of our data. And so this process of trying to come up with good features of a time series, um, is sort of a fundamental problem um, in many uh, mHealth problem domains. So um, again, what this looks like is sort of geometrically, um, we define a space, a two-dimensional space of duration and stretch. Um, and our job is to then map the instances in to that space. And this is just feature pre-processing or feature extraction, 
Okay, so we can just write down an algorithm that looks at these waveforms and figures out what's the maximum amplitude and the minimum amplitude and calculates the stretch. The length of these windows, respiration cycle uh, lengths, tell us the duration. And so we can take every one of these um, examples that we have, every cycle that we have, and we can map it into this space, right? Um, so every one of these turns into a stretch duration pair. Uh, from there, um, you know, we, we do this for all the data that we have. Um, and then we also need the labels, as I mentioned before. So we'll have smoking uh, puff labels and uh, non-smoking uh, respiration cycles. So we'll call those um, class zero and class one. We'll call that, color them red and blue. Um, and so we can just make a, make a map out of this, right? So maybe everything in the top right here corresponds to smoking and everything in the bottom left um, is the non-smoking class, right? So if we've got our, da our data like this, it's all laid out, it's labeled, we've featureized it, embedded it into this two-dimensional numerical space. Um, at this point, um, we've got our data um, and we can, we can build our machine learning model on top of it. Um, so the specific problem that we're interested in is a generalization problem where really what we want, we're not interested in the labels of the data we already have, we're interested in predicting labels for new instances. So the actual puff detection problem is assume a new instance comes in, um, we need to predict a label for it. So the first thing we would do is embed it into this space. And then we have to ask the question, what label should it have? Should it have the smoking label or the non-smoking label based on its stretch and duration features that have been extracted? So the learning problem here is given the labeled data set, learn a function that when we provide it with a new output gives us a corresponding, a new input gives it a, cor a corresponding label. So we want the uh, function that will tell us is this new instance based on its features, smoking or non-smoking. So there are a couple of steps to that. Um, the function that actually does the mapping, so takes the stretch and duration and gives us back the class label. Um, this, is, is, this function is called the classification function or more simply a classifier. So its structure looks like this. We'll take our instance, we'll pull out its features, um, its stretch or its duration and stretch. Um, the function needs to take that input and then map it into um, zero or one, let's say for class zero or class one or, or equivalently red or blue. Right, so that's the structure of the function that we want. Um, and this function needs to be able to take any stretch and any duration and give us back an output for that particular stretch and duration. And the outputs always have to be zero or one for this to be a valid classification function for this domain. So the, the classification function will always say smoking or non-smoking. Right? Um, when we take that structure um, and think about what it looks like geometrically, so we can take the mathematical function that we have, we can think about applying it just everywhere in stretch duration space, right? We could grid up, grid up our space very finely into little grid cells. For every one of those grid cells, we could take the center and say, center of this cell, uh, does that correspond to smoking or non-smoking? And then we can color this space like a map. And so um, let's say we have a particular um, classification function or a classifier, and it colors the space like this, right? So the right-hand side is uh, smoking, the left-hand side is non-smoking. We can ask the question, is this a good classification function or not? It makes some errors. So there's a point up here in the top left that's misclassified. There's another one down here that's misclassified. Um, so this is maybe not a very good classification function for this particular problem, right? Um, here's one that's better, right? Um, so the actual um, classification uh, model that we think about is a set of possible classification functions. You can think about those either mathematically as mappings between stretch duration pairs in this case and the output, or you can think about it geometrically as this map that says for every point in the stretch duration space, what should we output? They're exactly equivalent sort of views. Um, so the classification model is just a set of those possible uh, maps or a set of those possible functions, right? Um, and so the, the um, classifier learning problem is the problem of selecting one of these maps or one of these functions from the space of possible functions um, that we're going to consider, right? And so we will say, we'll sort of look at what criteria you can think about for actually answering that problem or making the selection, right? So again, mathematically, um, as opposed to geometrically, um, this might be one particular simple class of functions. This is a class of linear hyperplane classifiers. It's attempting to separate the two classes with a straight line. Um, and it does that by defining three parameters. So um, we have a uh, weight times the stretch plus another weight times the duration feature. And we're looking at, if, is that value greater than uh, a third parameter here that is a, a threshold? Right. So this space of functions is sort of exactly the space of linear separators that we we're looking at up here, but for all possible separating lines, um, separating the two classes. Right. So um, often in machine learning, we're not making choices between a, a finite discrete collection of models. We define a mathematical model that has some parameters in it here, the W1, W2, and W0. Um, and what we try to find are the optimal parameters. Right. So we have a parametric uh, space of possible parameters. 
uh, classifiers here, F, and our job will be to try to pick these um, values, W0, W1, W2, um, according to some criteria, right? Um, and so for a problem like classification, um, in the classification learning problem, we've got our label data set, our inputs and our outputs. Um, when we learn the model, um, we need to specify a criteria. Uh, a typical criteria is to minimize error, right? What we'd actually like to do, so here are the YNs are the true outputs. Um, the FWs here um, are the actual um, function predictions, so the, the predictions of a particular classifier, and the Xs are the inputs. And so what we would like are the um, predicted inputs to match the, act, or sorry, the predicted uh, outputs to match the true outputs. And so what we're doing here is just counting up the number of mismatches over the data set that we have. And what we want are the parameters W that minimize the number of mismatches or the number of errors, right? Um, so that's not, that turns out not to be a directly practical um, way to optimize um, a classifier for some sort of technical reasons, but the intuition behind what we're trying to do when we're selecting a particular classifier for a problem is exactly this intuition. We'd like something that, that is minimizing the number of errors or that is approximately minimizing the number of errors that we're making um, through the choice of these parameters. Okay. So this is this um, sort of problem structure is an optimization problem, and it is the case that supervised learning problems sort of translate into optimization problems when you look at actually picking the optimal function, whether it's a regressor or a classifier, um, based on the data that you have. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of what it would look like to actually build a model of this type um, from this type of data, drilling all the way down to sort of how do we define a space of possible functions and then how do we select from that space. Um, a lot of the work in machine learning has to do with defining different spaces of classification functions. So the one that we were looking at here um, was a very simple space, just a space of linear separators. Um, that's a very restrictive space. So if your data cannot be linearly separated in your feature space, you're not going to do a very good job with a linear model. Um, lots of other forms of models exist that have nonlinear decision boundaries between classes or that have nonlinear relationships between regression inputs and targets. Um, a big problem in machine learning is controlling the complexity. You, you can build sort of arbitrarily complex spaces of functions. The problem is um, controlling that capacity. So how do you get a good match between the flexibility of the classifier um, and the complexity of the data that you have in your problem domain. So deep learning um, is an area um, that um, you know, provides very flexible models. Um, they often require lots of data to train um, and uh, careful control of that sort of capacity in some cases. Um, so the, the sort of fundamental machine learning research is on those questions around what should the, what should the model classes look like? What should the you know, classifications function, functions look like? How flexible should they be? Uh, and so on. Um, and all of this is just in the service of solving this one sort of reductive problem of classification, trying to map from inputs to targets. Um, so in a, we'll, we'll sort of wrap up quickly here. In the full space, everything that we just talked about is a process of learning um, sort of a single classifier. When we look at the deployment of the classifier um, or the learning of a classifier in the broader mHealth domain, there's a lot more going on. Um, so there's a whole big picture here about what it would actually mean to um, deploy this process in an mHealth context or in, or in an applied process where you need to start by collecting the data and collecting the labels and cleaning the data and extracting the features and then thinking carefully about the capacity control problem or notions of generalization. You always want to partition your data. So you're sort of learning your model on one set and you're evaluating it on another set. So you get a clean, you get sort of clean evaluation statistics. Um, this is often sort of a process where you need to look at the performance of a model, uh, you know, starting class of models, and then maybe your model's not particularly uh, good for your problem, or maybe it's not powerful enough. So you need to loop back around and sort of choose, uh, you know, make a different choice for the set of functions you're considering or the model that you're, you're trying to fit. Um, and then at deployment time down here at the bottom, again, like this classifier that you learned up here drops into a pipeline um, in, in deployment where you need to be performing all of these steps um, in an mHealth context, if you want to do this in real time, you need to be running, you know, data collection, data cleaning, feature extraction, the application of the, um, the uh, classifier all in real time, maybe on a mobile device. So there are lots of steps um, involved in the actual creation of a classifier that is beyond just the sort of core machine learning problem that people think about, that core optimization problem of what is the best function. Um, and then in a deployment context, there are all these additional considerations around the computational context, where the computation is running, how fast do they need to be able to execute and so on. Um, that is also important. So there's lots of stuff here to unpack uh, and think about. And maybe we, you know, uh, we can take some questions about this or I uh, think we ask the expert section that will happen uh, later in Institute. We can look at some of these questions there uh, as well.
Um, so to wrap up, um, I'll just go over some of these challenges that I mentioned, um, again, for the folks that may be more on the methodological side and to point out some of the potential issues here when you're deploying these uh, technologies. So the first is about label scarcity. Um, so here, I mean, in mHealth spe specifically, collecting a sufficient number of accurate labels can be difficult and costly. Um, there are trade-offs between the ecological validity and fidelity of label collection. I mentioned the idea that you might bring people into a lab to observe their smoking behavior. That's not very natural, right? So what they do exactly in a free living situation and what people do when you bring them into a lab um, is going to be different. But if you have people ambulatory or they're in a free living scenario and they're self-reporting, um, those data might not be very accurate. Right, so for machine learning to work well, it needs clean uh, labels that are not, um, you know, that are, that are free of noise, um, and that can often be hard to get um, in an M Health context. Um, feature design is another issue. So we looked at the extraction of sort of the stretch and duration space for smoking. Um, that was very reductionist, right? So that was just to give an example of sort of what some basic features could look like when people actually build models of this type. Um, typically, they're on richer feature spaces than what we looked at. Um, that was just to sort of show the idea of what uh, what the problem domain looks like. Um, you need effective feature engineering. Machine learning won't work if you have poor features. Um, you can also learn your way out of that problem using approaches like deep learning to extract good representations from data, but that typically requires more data, right? Um, you can sometimes solve that problem using unlabeled data and do some uh, representation learning using unsupervised methods and stack supervised methods on top. Um, but sort of being aware of the um, data requirements for some of these processes is important. Um, incompleteness is another huge problem in uh, machine learning for mobile health. So input data are rarely completely observed. Uh, both the sensor data and any self-reported data are subject to missingness due to non-wear and non-compliance with the completion of self-reported items. Um, missing data makes most machine learning methods just blow up. They will not work. So you need some form of imputation or data completion, or you need some somewhat more advanced machine learning methods uh, for dealing with that problem. Um, this is maybe part of um, data cleaning in the broader diagram that I showed. Uh, another problem, um, I guess that I mentioned already, is this lab to field problem. Um, models trained on lab data can fail to generalize well to the field. Again, this is often due to um, issues with ecological validity, and it ties into these constraints around your labeled data collection and um, you know, where your data are coming from. I guess both your labeled and unlabeled data, what do they look like? So if you bring people into the lab to study physical activity, what their gait patterns look like and what their patterns of activity look like in a free living situation could be quite different uh, than the lab. Um, between subject variability is another huge problem um, in uh, mHealth. So often when we're looking at small studies with 20 to 50 to 60 people, um, you know, you don't have enough data in some cases to find two people who look very similar to each other in terms of behavior. Um, and that can make model building difficult, right? So um, when we're taking data from many people and putting it together, um, and then we're trying to generalize to new people that weren't in our data set, um, we can see issues with that. And it just depends on how complex are the phenomena we're trying to study, how similar do the data look through the lens of our features um, across different subjects. Um, and these can create problems with the ability to um, predict well on new subjects. And it makes it, the data partitioning that I described quickly, where you have to split your data for training and for uh, validation or evaluation, that's very critical for getting a handle on the notion of generalization you care about. Is it to new data for the same people or is it to um, data from new subjects? And in mHealth, we're often interested in both of those. And how you design machine learning experiments impacts the sort of um, evaluation uh, that you want to perform. Um, the last thing I'll notice, I'll note here is algorithmic bias. Um, here, this is an important problem in machine learning. Um, standard machine learning models will learn biases based on the composition of the cohorts that you put in as the data. So between subject variability can turn into um, problems with the performance of methods on particular groups. Um, so uh, you may end up with a data set where you have many more um, women than men, or you may have younger uh, adults and you're interested in deploying to older adults, or you may have had a data set where it's very um, homogeneous in terms of the races of individuals that are represented. Um, and you need to be really careful about trying to evaluate methods to ensure that they're not systematically biased um, against uh, particular uh, groups in terms of their performance. So you wouldn't want a method that was much poor performance maybe on the population um, that you had as uh, your input data, um, you know, the majority of your input data, and then underperform um, on underrepresented groups in your data. So there are various methods that you can use to sort of de-bias or try to uh, attempt to de-bias the data that you have so that you're learning something that is going to perform more evenly um, across the demographic characteristics of the population that you might actually be interested in applying your models to. Okay. 
So I'll I'll wrap it up there. There's a, sort of a, a lot to um, a lot to unpack here. We're just getting started um, in the institute. Um, with this sort of material around machine learning. So again, there'll be more opportunities to ask questions and sort of interact as we go on. I um, certainly welcome questions from folks throughout the time span of uh, what we're gonna be working on for the summer. So um, thank you very much for your attention.